Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, I'm David Holsell. I work in the clinical biochemistry lab at um, Addenbrooke's Hospital and we provide thyroid function tests for our local GP community and also for the hospital itself. I also provide a national referral centre for unusual thyroid function tests. So first of all, a disclaimer from me. Um, thyroid function tests are only one element of the, the, the things we can offer for people uh, with suspected thyroid disease and they can't be interpreted on their own. This is, this is known in the trade as treating the numbers. We need to look at all of the aspects of the, this picture to interpret the tests correctly. So we've got how you're feeling, very important, your doctor's assessment of your thyroid status, and also any possible medications that you might be taking. I'm not qualified to talk on any of these. As I've said, I'm, um, I'm from the laboratory, so I can only talk about around the thyroid function testing. Uh, but in my defense, I've seen an awful lot of thyroid function tests. Last year we did um, just over a third of a million tests in the Cambridge Laboratory. So as you can imagine, I don't get out very much. So I'd like to thank Julia for inviting me along. It's great to get the chance to meet you all. And any feedback I can take back to the laboratory, uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to, to, uh, to feed back. And also it's very, very useful for myself. So the, the remit I've been given today is to talk about um, understanding thyroid function tests, a little bit on reference ranges, and if there's time left over, what happens when we get the more unusual thyroid function tests through the laboratory. So what are thyroid function tests? I'm, I think you're all aware of what a thyroid function test is. It's a blood test um, which can give us some indication about how well your thyroid's working. This works quite well for endocrinology because the purpose of an endocrine organ or gland is to secrete hormones into the bloodstream to be distributed around the body. So if we can measure uh, the hormones in the bloodstream and then compare in patients who have symptoms of either hyper or hypothyroidism, this can give us a clue as to what's happening uh, in the gland. So these are the tests that, uh, as Christine's already mentioned, that we offer. The first line test will be TSH and this is the hormone that controls the thyroid itself. We can also look at the output from the thyroid, the thyroid hormones, which we've already been introduced to, T4 and T3. And then as we know that thyroid disease is caused, I'll just, just take that up. We know thyroid disease is, is generally an autoimmune condition, so we can look at the antibodies that cause Graves' disease or antibodies that are associated with thyroid destruction in, in Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. So I'm, I, I nail my colours to the mast, I'm a great fan of the TSH assay. I think TSH is one of the greatest triumphs of uh, laboratory medicine. With a simple blood test, we can rule out a primary thyroid disease in uh, the vast majority of people that, uh, that present. But as all tests, there are limitations, and we need to be absolutely aware of the limitations if we're going to use TSH on its own as a, as a test for thyroid function. TSH has had quite a lot of bad press at the moment, which I'm more than aware of. So what I'll attempt to do in the past half hour is explain why we think it's a good test and also try and help explain the limitations that are involved in just using TSH as a frontline test. So you've already seen this already and I'm sure you're all familiar of it. This is how the, the thyroid is, is regulated. So the pituitary is the master regulator for most of the endocrine glands in the body. And effectively what the pituitary does is taste the blood and taste to see how much T4 is present in the bloodstream. If the pituitary thinks there isn't enough, it secretes this hormone TSH, uh, which stimulates the gland to produce thyroid hormone T4 and T3. These feed back on the pituitary, tell the pituitary that we've now got the right amount of thyroid hormone and uh, TSH secretion is stopped. So, this is one of the reasons why TSH is a good test. We're measuring the pituitary's response to thyroid hormone rather than measuring the thyroid hormone itself. So this is a more physiological signal, but we also like it as it acts as a, sing a signal amplifier in the laboratory. So what we get is a small change in, T in free T4 or free T3. We'll give a large change in TSH. So I've attempted to explain this graphically in the next slide. And if we look at a patient uh, if we look at a, an individual who has a TSH of around 15, which is around the normal value, if the free T4 drops slightly on the uh, y-axis here, 
we see a very large response in TSH. So as T, T4 goes down a little bit, TSH goes up a lot. And in the other situation, if thyroid hormones start to go up, TSH is closed down very quickly and drops to undetectable. So it's a very sensitive marker for thyroid disease. It's quite difficult to interpret in this sort of curved graph. So what we tend to use in the lab is a, a, a linearization of this. So it's the same data, but we just use a logarithmic plot. So on the y-axis, we've got a small change in T4. This changes in uh, a unitary value. But on the x-axis, TSH is now changing by a factor of 10. And that makes it a, a nice linear graph, which is easiest to understand. So this is the sort of nomogram that's quite common in textbooks. So we have, uh, if we use a TSH, if TSH is within the reference interval, then the chances of primary thyroid disease are really quite unlikely. If TSH is high, then we, measure, we recommend measuring thyroid hormones, and this will confirm a diagnosis of evolving hypothyroidism. On the other side of the graph, if TSH is low, so we're going into the, the red zone here, we measure both thyroid hormones. Our recommendation is to measure both T4 and T3 in this situation, as both can uh, affect TSH. And this will uh, suggest uh, an evolving hyperthyroidism. So I want to share with you some of the challenges uh, that we have in the clinical laboratory. So this is a rather complicated graph of all of the things that we measure in the lab. And it's in order of how, uh, how much substance there is in the bloodstream. So the most common constituent of blood is obviously water. Next comes salt. I think we're all, all aware that blood tastes salty although I wouldn't recommend this as being any sort of quantitative diagnostic test. <laughs> so, salt is about 135 milli equivalents of salt per litre of blood. For thyroids, this is a real challenge. Thyroid hormones are right down the other end of the scale in this bottom left-hand corner, and there's uh, 10 pico equivalents of this. So, so these are big numbers, and it's quite, quite hard to understand. But if we think for sodium in the blood, it's a teaspoon of salt in a litre of water. If we're looking at thyroid hormones, it's a teaspoon of water in a very a teaspoon of salt in a very very large volume of water, something to the equivalent of the volume of Loch Ness. So that's that's the challenge that we're trying to measure when we measure thyroid hormones. But that's not all. Not only is there not very much, it's also in quite a complex mixture, and we've got very similar molecules in there that we need to discriminate. So, so again, Christine's shown you the structures of 3T3 and 3T4. The only difference being the extra iodine in the bottom right. So if we wanted to tell the difference between these two molecules, and indeed you're all telling me that you do want us to measure the difference between these two molecules, we need an assay that can measure these two specifically and at very low levels. So we do this in the laboratory by a technique uh, known as immunoassay. The body has developed a very sophisticated method for testing the shape of small molecules and it uses this mainly to resist infection from bacteria or viruses or, or even to detect tumour cells. And this is based around this little Y-shaped molecule, the, the, uh, the antibody. And this can detect molecules which the body thinks belongs to itself and the body uh, that the body doesn't think so. So we harness this in the lab as a, as a method for measuring the, the hormones that we're interested in. This is an immune, immunoglobulin molecule. They're tiny. You could get 100,000 of these on a pinhead. And this one's been directed against thyroxine. So you can see thyroxine, the little ball, uh, the, the spherical model in the corner, which has um, been bound to this antibody. And this is the basis of all the testing we use. So this shows how TSH is measured in um, virtually all uh, laboratories that measure it. And this is called a sandwich assay for obvious reasons. So what we have is two antibodies directed against TSH. And only when we've got TSH, which forms the, the meat in the sandwich, if you like, to uh, uh, join the two antibodies together do we get a signal. Because we've labelled one of the antibodies with a, this um, glow-in-the-dark molecule. And the other antibody is attached to the, the machine we use to measure it. So this gives us a very specific and sensitive signal. It's very sensitive because the antibodies bind TSH very tightly and the, uh, the fluorescent signal we use is very, very sensitive, it's very bright. But it's also very specific because we've got these two antibody binding sites, which means we've got two chances to check that we're binding the right molecule. So the assays we use don't react with other pituitary hormones, which are really very similar, both LH and HCG. HCG is the, the one that's found in pregnancy tests, 
don't cross react in our TH assays these days. It's very specific, it's very sensitive. This is why I um, uh, recommend TSH as being an incredibly robust me uh, method for ruling out thyroid disease. This is 3T4. I make no apologies for this hugely complicated slide. T4 is very hard to measure for some of the reasons that uh, Christine's already mentioned. For a start, it's much smaller than TSH. We can only use one antibody. We can't raise two antibodies to 3T4. Uh, so we have to use this competition uh, method to try and detect it. So we need to use a coloured uh, T4, which is what we make in the laboratory. That's the red molecule. And it competes with the yellow molecule for uh, the number of sites on the antibody. So we've already lost a degree of specificity here because we've only got one, one antibody. The big problem is the problem that Christine's already mentioned. Most of T4 in blood is protein bound. It's bound to protein, uh, protein molecules whose function it is to deliver T4 around the body. But we need to measure the free bit. That's the best signal for, for thyroid disease. So for every 10,000 molecules of T4 that are bound, there are only three molecules in solution. And this is a challenge for us because we have to measure these even though there's a huge amount of um, T4 bound to the, the proteins. So we need to measure it in a way that we don't knock off this huge excess of protein bound molecules. So this generates several problems for us. Uh, we've tried long and hard to get T4 assays better, but they're invariably somewhat dependent on the amount of bounding, binding protein that's present, which is varies between people. And there are also genetic variants in the binding proteins, which uh, cause a challenge for our assays. But I think by far the bigger problem is the, the drugs that are subscribed. As, as Christine's already said, some of these binding proteins aren't particularly specific. So com some commonly used drugs can kick T4 off the binding proteins and cause a, an erroneous signal. Heparin, I think, is the most staggering effect that uh, most clinicians are aware of. It causes a huge rise in free T4. But other drugs, such as antiepileptics, can also cause this effect. So free T4 is a challenge. I look at that diagram and I think constantly surprised that this assay works, but it does work rather well, but it doesn't work quite as well as the TSH assay. So the other challenge we have is the volume of testing we're expected to do these days in the laboratory. So we've moved from a system which looked very much like a, like a chemist's laboratory, uh, a lot of manual techniques, uh, to something which now which looks like a production line. Uh, we're um, more often than not now, we're measuring more than 100, uh, 1,000, sorry, 1,000 thyroid function tests per day. This is, uh, in part, the NHSI have worked out that you get better value if you have large laboratories that process larger numbers of samples. So this is putting an increasing challenge on us now. We're expected to do more and more uh, testing. And in a way, we're a victim of our own success because we've developed much more robust, much more automatable testing. We can turn them around quicker and demand... Uh, goes up with it. So, so the challenge in the laboratory, our, our mantra in the lab is each one of those blood tubes you see there is a person and we need to maintain standards no matter how many samples go through the laboratory we still have to try and uh, uh, make sure that our results are delivered to the same standard. So just, to, just a little bit on third line testing. As I've said, most thyroid disease is caused by autoimmune conditions and it's possible for us to measure the antibodies uh, that either reflect destruction of the thyroid in Hashimoto's hypothyroidism or cause Graves' disease. These are antibodies that actually stimulate the thyroid to produce T4. So this is where these sit in our diagnostic pathway. Uh, if you've got low TSH, high free T4, suggestion of hyperthyroidism, we would recommend that you use this, this TRAB test. TRAB tests is, are one of the best laboratory tests we have. They're really extremely effective in diagnosing Graves' disease. Unfortunately, at the moment, they're not completely, uh, they're not available all around the UK, and that's one of the things we hope to address uh, with our guidance, that this test should be widely available as a test for Graves' disease. Unfortunately, TPO, uh, our test for hypothyroidism, is nowhere near as good. A lot of people have raised TPO antibodies who will never go on to develop thyroid disease. So it's a risk for hypothyroidism, but it only really helps if the levels are really quite high. 
So moving on to the next, next bit of my talk, which is about reference intervals. It's, I think it's rather ironic that I've been uh, picked to talk on reference intervals because they're not my favourite subject. I do worry about reference intervals and I think what reference intervals do is lead uh, to the overinterpretation of the data we produce. But they're, they're there to address the question of should everybody's thyroid function test be the same and should my thyroid function test be the same every time we measure it. So I'm afraid, if, uh, hopefully this won't turn into too much of a rant, but uh, let's start off with it's not a normal range, it's not normal and it's not a range. It's certainly not a target. Okay, so this shows uh, the uh, Gaussian distribution. This is a very common distribution that's seen in biology and in medicine. This shows that the uh, blood pressure readings taken in an ostensibly healthy population. And you can see most people have a blood, test, uh, a blood pressure, a diastolic blood pressure, of around 60 millimetres of mercury. And the way the Gaussian distribution works is the further away you get from this result of 60, the less likely you are to find people in either direction. So very few people will have either very high or very low blood pressures. But we know having abnormal blood pressure is bad for you. Having high or low blood pressure is, is not a great place to be. And we also have medications to treat this. So the idea of this sort of distribution is so we can target people who are likely to benefit from medication that will either raise or lower their blood pressure. TSH is exactly the same if we use our, uh, our funny log distribution here. So this is um, data from the literature of an ostensibly healthy population where we've measured TSH in hundreds of people. So in, in the same way as blood pressure, it's a Gaussian distribution. The interesting thing about this data set is there are some people in this population who have a TSH greater than 10. So by our guidance, we would say they're likely to have hypothyroidism, they're likely to have thyroid disease. So we've got ourselves a problem here. This is our, our reference data set. Do we take these people out? Do we say these people have got thyroid disease, make our distribution na narrower, or do we leave them in and make our distribution wider? So this is a problem. We, we're trying to use this data to work out who would benefit from medication. So I think, I think this question was first addressed by Sir Ronald Fisher back in 1913, who was a great uh, biological statistician. Um, and he's, um, he made a rather pragmatic but staggeringly arbitrary decision that 1 in 20 was the number which we considered as abnormal. So if you take the reference population, we make the con uh, conclusion that 2.5% at the bottom, 2.5% at the top are abnormal. A lot of med modern medicine is based on this sort of, this sort of logic. Um, this is what your reference range is. When you look at your reference range, be aware it's a population of individuals who may or may not have had thyroid disease excluded, and we've arbitrarily decided that one in 20 of them is abnormal. So this causes us problems in the laboratory. I don't know if you've seen these sort of data before. I guess most people think on the way in that more tests is better. And the more tests that the doctor gives me, the more chance I am of finding an accurate diagnosis. And I'm afraid if we use this sort of logic, that's not the case. So I've already said, if you go in, if you're a healthy person, you go in, you decide you want a blood test, there's a one in 20 chance that you're going to be labeled as being abnormal. The more tests you have, the more likely that's going to happen. So when you get up to one in five tests, there's a racing certainty that at least one of your blood tests is going to be slightly abnormal. So in the laboratory, we're challenged with this as being some sort of penny-pinching exercise that we're trying to deny people access to tests. Well, actually, we are trying to save money. Obviously, we're trying to save money. We want to direct our limited resource to people that benefit most from it. So the indiscriminate use of testing is, is not just wasting money, it's also bad medicine, it causes the doctor a lot of problems because they've now got an abnormal result to deal with, and it causes patients an awful lot of anxiety, which we don't help in the laboratory by putting a little H next to the test. <laughs> so we need to be uh, aware of, um, of this problem with over-requesting. So I think I, I prefer this method, um, called the odds ratio. So I think we've got our normal range here in blue. No amount of torturing the normal range, the reference interval, is going to make it any better or any more useful. If we're going to uh, advance practice, we need to understand what results we're expecting in people with illness, not the results we're going to expect in people with, uh, who, who are well. 
So I guess anybody who's, who's uh, into horse racing will get this straight away. We generate something called the odds ratio by looking at the ratio of the number of tests in people with thyroid disease compared to the ratio of um, people who are normal. So it's the odds of being, picking a winner or picking a loser. So if we start at the bottom end of the graph and we move our diagnostic threshold up, at the beginning, everybody counts as positive. If we slide our diagnostic threshold up to about a level of one or two, we're excluding all of these healthy people, which is what we want to do. We want to say you're healthy. So when we get to two, we exclude the healthy people. We start now excluding some people who may have evolving hypothyroidism. It's not until we get to a level of 10 when everybody above that is hypothyroid. There are very few reasons of having a TSH greater than 10 apart from being hypothyroid. And that's where the value of 10 comes in the guidance. This, this is a specific cutoff for thyroid disease. If we look at our upper reference interval, as shown by the arrow here, we've got a problem. Because this is the point on the curve for thyroid disease where unfortunately the odds ratio is the same. If you have a TSH of four, the test can't tell you whether you're hypothyroid or whether you're in the healthy group. This generates some difficult discussions because the same is true for a value of 3.9, which is in theory within the reference interval, or 4.1, which is just outside the reference interval. And this is where the TSH test has the least utility in determining whether you're hy uh, hypothyroid or whether you fit in this normal group. So at this stage, we need to use other things the other legs of the stool, we need to use symptoms, we need to use signs to determine who's most likely to benefit from treatment. Okay, so this is our, our, our theoretical person. We're all very good at saying what our average person looks like, and this is how you might expect T4 and, and TSH to respond. In practice, we see this, this variation. People are not all the same. Everybody has different, slightly different set points. So where does this variation come from? From a laboratory point of view, we want to be sure that we are not adding to this variation. We want to be able to tell you that if you have your thyroid function test done today, we'll give you the same result tomorrow, the same result next week, and you'll get the same result from different parts of the country. So this is how we test for, for this in the laboratory. What we do is we take the same sample and we run it multiple times. So this is data from last November. Um, we've run the same sample on all of our three big machines that we use to do thyroid function tests. And we monitor what result we're getting. And you can see that they do vary. It's just a, a, a fact of life that if you make experimental measures, you'll see variation. But I hope I can convince you that this variation is not particularly significant compared to uh, the variation you need to make clinical decisions. Uh, some of the sharp-eyed amongst you might say, well, what's happening to your red analyzer? It seems to be drifting up a little bit. And... Um, I rest assured in December we took that machine down and recalibrated it. So th this is the sort of thing we do in the lab to reassure ourselves that we're not adding to the variation in TSH measurements. So not everybody is lucky enough to be able to send their samples to our lab. So how do you know that other labs in the country are, are, are performing equally well? And not everybody uses the same method that we use in our lab as well. So this is another form of assurance that we can give you that we're measuring the right thing. And this is called external quality of assurance. So it's the, the, the principle is exactly the same. We take the same sample and we send it to all of the NHS labs around the country and say, do you get the same result? And there's a little bit more variation here, but I hope I can convince you that it's not, um, it's not huge. So the result we got, our result up there, 1.78. If you compare it to what everybody else in the country got using the same method, they got, here we are, Advia 1.76. So, so all of the Advias are agreeing reasonably well. If you look at different methods, and I guess the two big methods are the Abbott and the Roche, you see on average the Abbott reads slightly lower at 1.6, and the Roche reads slightly higher at 1.99. So there is difference across the country on how we measure it, but it's not significant. The reason I like TSH is pretty much everybody gives you the same answer. This could mean that everybody could use the same reference interval. And there's a lot of work going on by the Inter International Federation of Clinical Chemistry to try and align these assays even better so it is possible to use the same reference interval. But if you go back to thinking about reference intervals, it depends a little bit on what part of the world you're in, what ethnic, uh, the ethnic mix of the population you're looking at. So at least we can make sure that 
TSHs are the, are the same. For ET4, of course, is different. I've already said it's much harder to measure. It's much harder to measure well. And there are significant method differences with 3T4. So depending on where you get your 3T4 measurement, you'll have to use a different interval and you'll have to use a different range and they're not necessarily comparable. So you can see that the Beckman method has a, a mean of 11.5, whereas the center method we use has a, has a mean of 14.5. So if you're going to read the literature or you're going to compare results from different assays, you need to be aware that we're not reading the same thing. This problem is fixable as well. And there's a lot of work going on to make sure that we can um, harmonise T4 methods to make sure they read the same. Unfortunately, we haven't got there yet. OK, and the, I, I guess the third level of check is we have our own independent regulator, OFLAB, or UCAS they're known as. And this picture is just to, to demonstrate to you all that we welcome the chance every year to get the assessors into the laboratory so we can convince them how good our, our laboratory testing is. So I put the, I've already had a question about this this morning. If you're not going to use NHS labs to get your thyroid function testing done, and that's fine, you know, you, everyone's welcome to uh, get thyroid function tests from wherever, it's important to you as a consumer to have some assurance from the people who are providing the tests that they're getting the right answer. So if you're going to use a non-NHS laboratory, ask them for some quality assurance. If they're a reputable firm, they will give it to you straight away. If they're not, then I think you need to um, be quite careful about what you're spending your money on here and there's a potential for more harm than good. Okay, so, we're, so I'm now saying confidently that the laboratory isn't contributing too much to the variation in TSH. So if it's not the laboratory, it's a biological variation. People have different set points for TSH. So this was very, a very good study done a while ago. Uh, this is um, 50 patients who had their thyroid function tests done three times a day over a period of two weeks. So what we've got here is the black dots are the average TSH measurement for each patient. And the whiskers are is the range of TSH measurements over the, uh, the two-week period. And our two black parallel lines are the reference interval for the entire cohort. So it's the 95% confidence interval for all of the readings. And you can see straight away that there's quite a difference in set points for TSH. So we've got some individuals down the bottom who are running a TSH of about, point th of about 0.3, and it's not changing. At the other interval, we've, at the other end, we've got people who are running an average TSH of about 2.5. And, and there are some people whose TSH seems to change more than others. So that this is the idea of personalised medicine, that everybody has their own set point. And if it comes to, if, if any of these people are unlucky enough to get thyroid disease, then you could say the person who has 11.3 um, isn't going to respond so well to be treated as a, a level of um, 2.8 with the other people. So we've tried to catch this in the guidelines that there's a degree of flexibility about how you interpret the reference ranges. Unfortunately, there's no great data to support this at the moment. Um, there have been studies where we've tried to titrate people to different TSH levels and there hasn't been a great deal of a, a benefit shown to date. So then just, just to, to finish my uh, part on the reference interval, um, I, I think the conclusion is that reference intervals are more than a guideline than an actual rule and we've tried to incorporate this in the guidance that there's uh, opportunities to titrate within the reference range. But I think there's a strong caveat here that I don't think you want to titrate people outside, too far outside of the reference uh, range because there, are, there will be consequences of this. So unfortunately I'm running very short of time so we'll just um, uh, whip through uh, a section on unusual results. So that shows our average person, that shows our average person with variation that we've just discussed. This shows real world data. So this is a month worth of data that's um, collected from my own laboratory. Uh, the people in the pink region have got thyroid function tests within the reference interval. The people between the parallel lines have what we would expect from people who are uh, at risk of hyper or hypothyroidism. And then we have these dots which lie outside, and these are, this is, the technical term for this is unusual results. Two reasons for this. The laboratory could give you the wrong result, or it's a correct result, but this is, there's a risk of this result might be misinterpreted. 
So wrong results is the worst nightmare for the laboratory. Uh, without discussing the ethics of this too much, the antibodies we use are typically raised in mouse, rabbits or sheep. People who have excess exposure to these an animals can raise antibodies against them and this will mess up um, a lot of the laboratory testing we're doing. But we're looking at excess exposure here. It's not if you've got a rabbit at home, I don't think it's a particular issue for you. We only usually see this in people who have occupational exposure uh, to animals, laboratory technicians. I have seen it once in a local, um, at the chairwoman of our local Rabbit Fantasies Association, but this lady had more than 200 rabbits at home. So it's rare, very rare, one in, one in 50,000. That doesn't help if you're the, the person that's affected by this. Most laboratories are aware of this and we go out of our way to, uh, um, to try and uh, mitigate this sort of effect. So then there's a, a great long list of things where using TSH alone may not be the, the right test to use. And this can be TSH is within the reference range, but 3T4 is outside. Or we know that TSH is a more sensitive test than 3T4. So TSH tends to move before 3T4. And th this is the term that we call subclinical disease. And we'll talk about this a bit, a bit more later on today. Um, I don't like the term subclinical disease because it infers it's a disease. It could equally as well be called subclinical normal because a lot of these patients will uh, revert back to being euthyroid rather than uh, progress to uh, disease. The other situation, we've advocated using TSH as a front line, so we need to be aware of all these caveats uh, in this particular box, pituitary disease being the main one. If we're using TSH as a, as a test, we need to be absolutely sure that the pituitary axis is, is working correctly in order to do this. And this can, this can happen in both ways. You can either have um, a pituitary tumour that causes TSH secretion or, um, or pituitary disease which prevents TSH secretion. So we need to be aware of that. Um, we also need to be aware that some patients we know that are on T4 treatment need to run T4 just outside the reference range in order to normalise TSH. So again, I'm conscious that I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll try and wrap up here. I think possibly the most contentious uh, th thing on this, um, this list is the poor symptomatic response to treatment. We know that there are a lot of patients out there who have their thyroid function tests perfectly within range who still have symptoms of thyroid disease. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any laboratory tests that can help in this situation. I would argue that you need to have your TSH close to the reference interval. There's some debate about whether measuring T4 or T3 or T4, T3 ratios could help uh, with symptomatic control here. But at the moment, uh, evidence for this is, is um, not available. So I just demonstrated graphically these two situations. This is what subclinical disease looks like to the laboratory. So the patients in the green box could either go on to develop disease or jump back into the reference interval. At this stage, the laboratory tests aren't going to help. You need to be looking at the other legs of the stool to determine whether patients will benefit from treatment. These are the risks of using TSH uh, alone as a strategy. The very high result, there are two patients here. One has an abnormal, um, a genetic condition which is causing thyroid hormone resistance. One of them has antibodies to TSH which is causing the wrong result. The bunch that are just sitting over the line are people who are on treatment who need to run T4 slightly high. And I would challenge whether measuring T4 has done anything but cause anxiety in the patient and the doctor in this situation. And the people in the bottom red box are our patients that are at risk of hypothyroidism. Okay, so this is my, I've now changed our nomogram, which looks slightly more confusing than it did on the way in, but I've tried to capture all of these situations. We've got our patients which fall within the reference interval, subclinical disease either side, and uh, what I've termed unusual results, in which case these, these, um, these results need to be looked at further using different methods. It's a great team I work with, our laboratory team, uh, take on an ever-increasing relentless workload and uh, always go the extra mile to look at the, the more challenging cases. And a, a clinical team, of course, who are responsible for the other three legs on the stool. I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I'm very happy to, to take your comments back to the lab. <laughs> <laughs>